Hi, welcome back to Verilog Fundamentals. You're learning the most popular hardware description language, Verilog. And in this module, I'll go over the tools needed to get started and how to use them. I'll also begin to introduce some Verilog basic syntax and get you familiar with how the code looks. By the time you finish this module, you will have created and run a Verilog simulation using the tools you've chosen. You'll be able to start learning hands-on and get a handle for the syntax of the language, the provided libraries, and how it all works together. So, what do you need to write and run some Verilog? Start by choosing a compiler. You will need an editor that allows you to edit your source code. You can use anything for this, but it does help if the editor is language aware. It's also nice to be provided suggestions for autocomplete while you're typing. I've come to expect these types of features when working in a modern development environment. Finally, we're going to need a simulator. This is going to allow us to see our design in action, and it'll help us identify any problems with our design. It is very important to make sure we are confident in our design, especially if we want to, one day, turn it into a physical chip. Building describes the steps we go through in order to run a simulation with our code. First, we must write a register transfer level description of our design. Then, we need to write a module that's going to apply stimulus to our design, or our RTL description. In other words, this is just going to be a dummy circuit that will wrap around our RTL and apply test signals to the inputs of our design. This is sometimes referred to as a test bench. From there, the code is compiled into an executable program that will run our simulation. And then we can view our data printed out to the standard output by the stimulus. Or we can have the executable print out a value change dump file. And this can actually be created with just one simple system task. I'll show you how to do it later. And what this is, is it is a popular dump format for Verilog simulators. It contains the information necessary to visually display hierarchical information, signal values, and signal waveforms. And we'll, we'll see that later. There are a lot of good tools you can use. Icarus Verilog is a free and open source Verilog simulation tool. It is straightforward to use and easy to install. And that is the one I'm going to be using in this course for all the demos. Another good one is Questa formerly known as Model Sim. This was the first one I ever used and I like it, but at the time of this recording, it is incredibly difficult to navigate Intel's website and get a free license for the program. And that is the only reason I decided not to use this for my demos, unfortunate. Um, but feel free to check it out if you are interested. Verilator is an open source tool that can compile and translate Verilog or system Verilog code into a C++ or system C code. I plan on doing a future course covering this tool, but in this course, we're just focused on the Verilog fundamentals. Xilinx Vivado is AMD's complete design suite for FPGA and ASIC design. I have no experience with this tool and I can, I can barely pronounce it, but feel free to check it out if you're interested. Also widely used in the industry is Synopsys VCS and Cadence Incisive Enterprise Simulator. I have no experience with either of these, but if you have access to them and you prefer them, uh, feel free to use those for these demos. For source code editor, I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code, uh, and I think you're gonna like my setup once you see it. Uh, just keep in mind that you're free to use whatever source code editor you prefer. Other tools worth mentioning, I'm going to be using GTK Wave, which is an open source waveform viewer that takes uh, various file formats, including that value change dump file I was speaking about earlier, and displays the waveform. And I'm also going to be using WSL2 on Windows 11. Uh, I'm using Windows 11, well, I decided to take the leap and upgrade to Windows 11, but the reason why I'm using WSL2 on Windows 11 is because it came with a really nice update that allows you to create uh, graphical windows from that Ubuntu or Linux command prompt right into Windows 11. It's all integrated now. 
Uh, previously in Windows 10, I had to have this third-party application running that was a X server that would listen for X11 window forwarding from uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows 10. That's that's all not necessary anymore. That's all integrated into Windows 11, which is awesome. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in the demo later in this video. Another thing worth mentioning is online compilers. They require zero installation to get started. And I really want to highlight this EDA Playground online compiler. Uh, I didn't spend too much time playing around with it, but it looks like a really good option. It does allow you to get those VCD dump files, and it also lets you get access to those uh, paid-only industry tools. So it's definitely worth checking out. The only drawback is they do require you to create an account, and they do require you to verify your account. Another one worth mentioning is Tutorials Point, which does use Icarus version 10, which is what I'm going to be using, but I was unable to get this online compiler to generate a VCD file. So just be aware that some demos may not work for you if you choose to use this as your tool. For those who may not know, an IDE is an abbreviation for an integrated development environment. It consists of an editor, a compiler, some sort of debugger, and other related tools. I'm using Visual Studio Code because, well, First of all, it's free, let's be honest here. Uh, it comes with some great extensions that offer syntax highlighting and linting capabilities out of the box. It also allows you to define custom tasks that allow you to turn it into an IDE. So I'm gonna show you all the steps necessary in the demo later on how you can create your own custom integrated development environment. It's uh, really not too hard to do either. The only thing missing is the debugger and setting the breakpoints. Uh, to my knowledge, I really don't think there is a traditional debugger for Verilog that lets you set breakpoints and then pause the simulation at those breakpoints. And it kind of doesn't really make sense to me when I think about it, because in Verilog, we're going to be defining modules, which is literally hardware circuits that are all going to be clumped together into some design, and they're all going to be running at the same time. And to be able to stop the simulator uh, when it hits a certain statement uh, it doesn't really I don't see how that would be helpful um, but let me know in the comments if you think you know of a real-time debugger for simulations I would be interested in taking a look at that tool keep in mind that you do not have to have my exact setup in order to do these demos you're free to choose whichever tool you like in this first demo I'm gonna walk you through what you need to set up our Verilog IDE Okay, hello. In this demo, I'm going to be going over my uh, IDE setup here. Uh, starting with Visual Studio Code, obviously head over to their website and download for your operating system. I'm going to be running on Windows 11, so um, just keep that in mind. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm not going to actually install this. I already have it installed, so we'll jump over to that in a second. I want to go over some of the extensions you're going to need. Uh, I'm using this Verilog HDL System Verilog Blue Spec System Verilog extension. Uh, it's got the ability to enable linting depending upon which compiler you're using. And I actually got Verilator for my linting support, but um, you're free to use whichever tool you want to use. Uh, I'm going to be using this Task Runner extension, and all this does is give you a new menu that lists out your um, tasks that you program yourself. I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. And then I also am using this WSL preview extension for Windows Subsystem for Linux. Uh, this means that basically I'm going to be coding on the WSL side. So speaking of Windows Subsystem for Linux, uh, if you're on Windows 11, you can head over to the Microsoft Store and all you have to do is type in Ubuntu or whatever flavor of Linux you prefer. I'm going to be using Ubuntu in this case, and I'm actually using 18.04 uh, down here. I already have it installed. And it gives you this uh, nice little prompt here. Cool. And another thing I want to point out since we're here is before it gives me my prompt, something starts up here and it says keychain, it has a link, 
and there's some existing SSH agent and I have an SSH key. Uh, what I've done here is I have basically set up uh, a SSH key with GitHub and I've installed a utility called Keychain. So you can run this command. Oh, link is in the description. All of these links I'm showing you right now are going to be in the description. But uh, yeah, you can install Keychain, follow this really well written guide here that shows you how to set up Keychain and then also how to generate an SSH key and then uh, add it to your Keychain. Uh, basically, this makes it so that when I launch Ubuntu, I am immediately using all of my SSH keys. And I went ahead and created an SSH key and used it with my GitHub account so that I am authenticated to my repositories using this SSH key. Uh, this is really convenient because ultimately, oops, I think I opened too many of these. Ultimately, you don't really want to count on you know, the storage that's in your Windows system for Linux. Uh, I like to have everything backed up and specifically I like to have all my code backed up into uh, GitHub. So that way, if I need to uninstall this app and reinstall it, or I just need to start from scratch or I've something's happened, uh, I'm not gonna miss any of the data I've put into my uh, Linux file system on Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, just a brief explanation. This really does put an entire Ubuntu environment nested inside of your computer. And if I open File Explorer here, I can navigate to a remote folder that's my Ubuntu 18.4, and I can start to browse all the files in that file hierarchy. So it really does add a entire second file system onto your computer. Get out of this. Cool. So link is in the description for how to add your SSH key onto your GitHub account if that's what you're using. You're not required to use GitHub. I just do recommend that as good practice. Uh, it's good to push your code to a repository. So here's the website for Icarus Verilog. And I just want to show you, you can actually, oh, uh, so you can read through this explanation. And it has this git clone command for cloning the repository. Uh, we are going to go ahead and clone this. But before we do that, I just want to show you that you can use you can use this link here and search it on Google and get to the repository yourself and you can sort of see what's inside before you download it and uh, read about it as well over here. I'll close that down. And uh, all I'm going to do is inside my Ubuntu environment, I need to stop opening new windows. Uh, I made a folder in my home directory called repos and I've got some of my personal repos in here but I'll go ahead and paste that command and clone that repository in here as well. Now I've already got Icarus Verilog installed and built but I just want to give you a brief idea of what this looks like. It's really not too hard to do. I guess while it is cloning we can jump back over to the repo on GitHub. Take a look at the readme. And all you need to do is type dot slash configure, type make, and then make install. And you probably need to run this with uh, super user privileges so that it actually has access, yeah, root access to get it to, into the installation directories. And once that is finished, okay, this time I will open another one. When that's finished, you're going to be able to issue this iVerilog command. And if you notice, I'm actually hitting tab to get autocomplete. And I can hit enter and it's right there on my path. So once you get to this point, you'll be good to go. So next up, I did also get Verilator, which we're not going to be covering in this course, but I decided to use Verilator for its linting capabilities. Uh, I couldn't immediately get the Icarus Verilog linting to work, but I went ahead and installed this using the git quick install. And by instead of doing the package manager installation, if you do the git quick install, it gives you all the commands to type in. So it says you're going to need git, Perl, Python 3, uh, and all you're going to do is copy this command and paste it right into your terminal and hit enter. I'll hit enter. It wants a password. 
and it's going to tell me I already have all this stuff. Um, but it gives you the instructions step by step each command and then they want you to clone it only for the first time and then you get to decide what version you're going to be using and then you type the auto config, config configure this make dash g tick mark uh, in proc this actually makes make build the folder using all cores on my cpu so like this thing started cranking out a bunch of uh, output pretty quick um, if you can get it to work but don't worry it just says just type make if you get an error so once you complete those steps and again link is in the description that gives me access to vera later right here on the command line and i can also get version here i'm on version 5.6 5. oh they're on 5.7 now uh, the first time i did it i did this apt get install and it actually gave me like version four or version three. It gave me an older version. These documentations doesn't match that older version. I wanted to use the latest features. So I went ahead and cloned the Git and that let me pick which version I want. And I got version five. Very cool. So we're installing a bunch of stuff. Um, one quick note that I want to point out is over on, let's see. Oh, okay. Well, before we get to that, um, so I've got Visual Studio Code over here, and I have Windows Subsystem for Linux installed here. But what you may not realize is uh, I've got these extensions installed, and what I've done, I can launch Visual Studio Code like this, and down here I get this new little window that says Opening Remote, and it says it's running on my Win uh, Ubuntu 18.04. Another thing that I can do is if I go into some random folder. Make a quick folder. If I go into some random folder on my Windows side, shift right click, and I got this open with code button here. And now I'm not connected to a remote anymore. I'm running on Windows side. So uh, this is what that extension allows you to do is it allows you to run VS Code in the context of your Windows system or in the context of your Ubuntu system. So what this means is, is I can make a directory called test and I can go into that directory and then I can type the command code dot and inside that folder or whatever folder I was currently in It'll open Visual Studio Code and connect me to my Win Ubuntu context. And if I open a terminal, this is my Ubuntu terminal. All within Visual Studio Code, that's gonna be the default. And what this also means is that the extensions are gonna be separate. You have your extensions on the Ubuntu side and you have your extensions on the local system side. I just wanted to point that out. And uh, if you are going to be diving into Vera later and you want to explore that more, we're not going to be covering that in this course, but I just wanted to show you that if you have, let's, let's open up a Vera later project. Where did I do? probably in the oh yeah I remember now in the examples and we can go into make hello C code dot this is one of the example directories that Verilator ships with and it just sort of sort of gives you an idea of how this thing works and the documentation walks you through these different examples and what they do and how they work and stuff and one of the things that happens when you run Vera later is the default folder it'll make is this object underscore dir. And you have over here a sim underscore main dot cpp. And it's detecting my language is C++. And there are these folders here, or sorry, these header files here called verilated.h and vtop.h. And if I right click on verilated and I go Darn it. Uh, I think it's because I don't have my C++ over. So 
So it's going to complain at me. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to find this source file, verilated.h, and it says it can't do it. And I can't go to definition because it just doesn't know where this thing is. So in order to fix this issue, if you're going to try and go off on your own and learn Vera later, I'm just taking a quick pause here to show this just in case if you're interested. Okay, so in order to fix this problem with the squigglies, uh, this little light bulb should appear. And there is this quick fix option for edit include path settings. If you click on that, you need to tell it where can it find your Vera later files. And if you leave everything on the default when you do the installation, you should be able to find it in this folder. So in the root directory, USR, local, share. I'm using tab to autocomplete, and I'm just typing a few characters. It should be in this directory, and these are all of your header files for Verilator. Um, and we can see the verilated.h file is here. So this path here is what you need in your include directories. So I'll copy that and close this down. And you need to not specify a compiler path. You need to specify an include path. So one include path per line. I'm going to make a new line here and paste that here. And I'll hit save. I don't know if it actually saves. When I come back here, the red squiggle goes away. And I can go to go to definition. And now it's able to find that folder with this header file and everything is good. I just wanted to throw that quick note out there if you're going to start exploring Vera later. Pretty cool tool. I do want to cover it in a future course. Okay, so now that we have Verilator installed and set up, uh, and while we're in here, we need to set up the WSL extension to use Verilator for linting. The way we do that is we go find the extension in Visual Studio Code. We click on the little gears here and we go to extension settings. And then if we start scrolling, there's a huge long list of stuff through here. And I kind of scrolled through it slowly to find this stuff. But if we type in Vera later, and well, before we do that, type in linting. And we can see there's linting settings if you're using iVeraLog, which we could use. Uh, linting settings for iVeraLog. And then here's the linting settings for which linter to use. Make sure that's set to Vera later. The default is none. And the other things you need to set is some Vera later settings. Vera, how do you spell Vera later? Vera later. There it is. Uh, so I set no timing because it was giving me warnings about my timing. Um, I said no warnings on this guy and uh, I put this compiler setting in here. I don't even remember what that does, but um, these are all things that like it was giving me warnings and errors on that I was like, uh, actually, no, this is perfectly fine because I'm using Icarus Verilog. These are things that Verilator doesn't necessarily like to see when it's compiling because Verilator isn't actually a simulator. It just converts code into C++ and System C. And you can turn that C++ or system C code into a simulation, but uh, there's no direct step process. But anyways, okay, so with those settings set, you should be able to then go, let's close this down. Let's go back to my home folder and we'll head into repos and we'll head into test. And we should be able to make a test.v. And I could type module. And I'm getting these autocomplete code snippets. And that's coming from the extension. It comes included with a bunch of code snippets, including one for module. And I'm just going to hit tab to autocomplete. And then I can write test as my module name. And then ports, I'm just going to say input a. And then I'm hitting tab to navigate to these different fields. And now I'm ready to start writing code for my module. I can hit save. 
And then if I put something that's going to be a syntax error, so there's no comma separating these two ports, uh, Verilator will underline problems and give you a message, and this is called linting. So that should be working now. So the other thing you need to get installed is GTK Wave, and in order to do this, I had to download the latest version, and it gives it to me in a .tar.gz, and then I transferred that .tar.gz into uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. So the way I did that was I copied my downloads folder, I head over to Linux, go inside my file directories, go into the home directory. Oh, sorry, that's not under USR. It would be under home C Kirk. And then I pasted it in here. And then you have to use the command to untar and unzip it. Um, and then you can install it. Uh, one of the things I had to, let's go take a look at that. So I created this downloads folder. And I put all my stuff in there. So there is the tar.gz. Uh, I don't have the commands memorized to untar something. So, so I'll put the link in the description, but this is really straightforward. You're going to type tar dot, or sorry, tar space dash z uh, xvf, and then you can unzip it. And then that will give you the directory, this directory. And there is a readme in here. And it gives you all sorts of helpful instructions for getting this set up. Uh, one of the things I noticed was when I did dot slash configure, it was complaining that it could not find TCL and TK8. And I didn't even have these in my USR slash lib. So I had to uh, install using the command sudo apt get, oh, I can't copy paste. Come on. There we go. And I got the dot five dash dev version. Uh, for TK and then I did the same thing again for ECL and this worked great for me so I have these installed now and then what that allowed me to do was it allowed me to uh, it allowed me to do the dot slash configure sorry let's just do the cat read me again it allowed me to run this dot slash configure and I had to specify where my TCL and TK libraries are and this command worked for me and the dot slash configure was successful uh, and then from there I believe you just simply need to type make and this make file will run. It's gonna look pretty much the same thing as this verilator instruction where you run the dot slash configure, and then you could do the make. You can do the parallel make, that, that, were, that did work for me, and then use sudo make install to actually get it installed into your path. And once you've done that, this allows you to get this GTK wave program, and I can hit tab and autocomplete it, and it'll show up there. And I'll hit enter, and it actually pops open with these windows. And we'll see later how to uh, use this, but just as an example, I could go take a look at, let's go back to my home directory. So it allows you to open these VCD files. So all I need to do is type GTK wave and then top.vcd and hit enter. And this will load up that VCD file and I can explore my different logic units and drop them onto the timeline. and I can navigate when these signals change. So we talked about GTK Wave, we got linting support running. Uh, I want to show you how that task runner thing works. So if I save this, there's no errors, very good. So over here on task runner, um, it has this button here, task runner, but there's nothing here. And 
the way you get this to work is, uh, let me jump over to the command prompt. If I do an ls, this is all the stuff I have in a different project folder. If I do an ls-al, I have this .vs code folder here. And let's just go ahead and copy. Oh, and I will provide you this .vs code uh, on my GitHub. I'll, I'll post a link in the description for you to get uh, all the tasks that I have already coded up with this setup. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy from tilde slash um, repos custom ALU dot VS code. And I actually need to do a dash R. I'm gonna put that into tilde slash repos. Where are we? Um, I think it's repos slash test. Well, not repo, repos slash test slash dot VS code. Enter. So suddenly now I have this VS code over here and I have something inside it called a task.json. And these are all of my tasks that you can download from my GitHub. Link is in the description below. Uh, but you'll notice that nothing changed on this task runner window here. If you make any changes to the JSON, you actually uh, need to close down VS Code and then open it again. So let's head over to tilde slash repos slash test. And then we can code dot. And then now task runner will be able to uh, detect all of these different tasks that I have defined. So we can build and it's going to invoke iVerilog on the file I'm currently looking at and it'll create an a dot out. Then we can run and absolutely nothing should happen when we do this run. But uh, and then we also have this waveform button. We also have a clean button. If I click clean, that's just going to get rid of my a dot out. And then that waveform button, let me just quickly show you how that guy works. So I'm going to recall my copy command and take off the recursive. I'm going to get that top.vcd file in here. D. And we're going to put it in top. Uh, well, no, this will be test.vcd. So now we have a VCD file in here. And if I click waveform, I'm going to open that exact VCD file. So it hides that window that pops up, but you can just bring it back up. And then we have all of our signals here. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of this task.json file and how it does its trick. Um, so basically it's gonna have version and then task and then this is a JSON array here. And you're gonna have basically, I'll, I'll put links in the description of how this all is set up. But uh, basically you're gonna have the name of the task the type it's going to be running in, and then the command that you're going to issue. And I discovered that you can actually type dollar sign. So let's make a new task right here. I'm going to copy this guy, paste it underneath. So this will be custom. And then I noticed that you can do something like this. Echo. So we're going to use the echo command. But if you type dollar curly braces and you start typing there's a lot of like autocomplete stuff here including like the file base name no extension and this is going to be whatever file you're looking at so I'm going to save this I just added a new custom shell command that echoes the file base name no extension and we can just leave all this other stuff as default I don't really mess around with any of it um Actually, I will take off this. I think this sets what is your default build task. We'll just take that off. I'll close it, save it. Um, but you'll notice task runner did an update here. Uh, so what we need to do is close out of VS Code. Then we can open code again. 
task runner loads up and now we have a custom task here and it's uh, parsing this list of JSON tasks in the order that they're listed here. And if I click custom, we can see that it's printing out tasks and that's because the current file I'm looking at that when I clicked on the custom task is tasks.json and we told it to print out the file base name with no extension. So if I jump over to test.v and I click custom, now it's saying test. That's the output of my custom task. Uh, and that's because test.v is the file that I had open when I ran that task. So you can start to see how you can use all of these autocomplete settings uh, available to you. I'm sure there's loads more that um, are available. And you can really stitch together your own basically custom scripts. Uh, oh, one final thing is all the way at the bottom, I have this test task. And this allows you to run tasks in sequence. Uh, and so I'm gonna do the clean and then I'll do the build and then I'll do the run. So I click on test and I click on test. It says there is no a dot out. So, but if I do a build, um, now there's an a dot out. And then if I do a test, it'll do the run, build and clean. Um, not in that order, but in the order specified here. So the possibilities are pretty open-ended on what you can do with this. It's pretty versatile. I'm going to walk you through the code for a simple Verilog simulation so that you can see the structure of the code and what parts stay the same, or we call it boilerplate code, and what parts are where you're going to write your code. This is the first Verilog syntax that you've seen, so I'm going to go through all of it slowly. Starting off with writing comments. Uh, so a comment is a line of code that the Verilog compiler is going to ignore, and it's more for human readable text. So notes to yourself or notes to other programmers can go here, and it's not going to throw any errors. And you start every comment with a slash slash. Then we have this, uh, I'll call it a magic invocation here, but uh, this is a very simple module definition. So every design is going to need to have a top level module and we'll dig more into this later. But as you can see, I've named my module top and so have an end module at the bottom there. Here we define an initial block. We can put statements inside the initial block to say what our module should do at time zero. In other words, this is what the initial things are for this module, and you can put all sorts of statements in there. This statement writes text onto the screen, and we're going to be writing this wonderful message of hello world. And this line ends the simulation for everybody, instantly, as soon as it is encountered. Notice that we are ending lines with semicolons. Also notice that Verilog is ignoring blank spaces between statements. I made the decision to indent my code to make it more organized and more readable. And I suggest you make good use of blank spaces as well. Okay, so we have our code here. We've got the display, hello world. And we've got it in a folder here running out of WSL Ubuntu. 18.4, I have my remote connection going. And down here on Task Runner, um, there's nothing here, but don't worry, all you need to do, quick restart of Visual Studio Code, and Task Runner will get all of your tasks that are in this tasks.json. We're gonna click Build. This will run iVerilog or Icarus Verilog on all of the .v files in our directory. And then it will create this a.out. And then we're going to click run, which simply runs dot slash a.out. And we get this hello world printed out here. And then it tells us that the simulation ended because of a finish call at time zero. 
And that's pretty much it for this demo. Really straightforward. This is more of a system check to make sure everything is working properly for you. You've seen real Verilog syntax and seen a simulation running, but I would like you to try it yourself using whatever tools you've chosen to use. Go ahead and make a folder for putting Verilog in. Maybe that's all you make is just a hello.v in a text editor. Or maybe you get your IDE to make a project or workspace with 1.v in it. Type or copy the sample code into that file, build it, and run it. And make sure that you see the same results that our simulation showed. It should simply print out hello world and then end. Once you know you can run it and you see the same output, you'll know you're able to follow along with all of the hands-on demos that are throughout this course. You need to make sure you have all this figured out now before we move on to more complicated code. This module covered some of the tools you can use to code Verilog. You're free to find tools and environments that will work for you. As long as you can edit your code, whether it's Vim, Emacs, Notepad, these are all gonna be okay. Uh, you're probably eventually going to want something that is code aware. So an editor that has features that can help you write code, but you're not going to be required to use one. You have to be able to build your code with some sort of Verilog compiler. You can use model sim, you can use Verilator. There are other things you can use, but for now, let's just focus on commonly used tools. You also need to actually run your code in simulation. This is how we're going to see any output and actually check if our design is working as intended. Throughout this course, you're going to do lots of simulations that print to the screen, just like we saw in the Hello World simulation. They are so simple to make. Later in this course, we're going to take a look at visualizing outputs into graphs. But for now, in the next module, we're going to start doing simulations that are slightly more complicated than just printing out a message to the screen. And we're going to start to learn how we can use the capabilities of the Verilog language.